if you're making art around or your creative process is driven by the stuff or inspired by the stuff that's fascinating to you and interesting to you, you're going to stay more engaged. And also you're going to end up making work that's different than anybody else's because your interests, you might have overlap in terms of what's interesting to you, but your interests are unique to you. And that's going to help you make work um, and develop subject matter for your work that is, that is unique to you. The Perspective Podcast is fuel for your mind and creative grind. Each week, my guests and I provide the skills for thinking bigger, overcoming adversity, and making an impact with your work. For those who don't know about you and your illustrious career, can you give us a brief Wikipedia page summary about yourself? Yeah. So, okay, brief. Let's 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 try this. <laughs> um, well, I'm about to turn 52, so I, for some perspective, I didn't start drawing or painting until I was 32. I might have been 31. I can't really remember. And it all started as a hobby for me. I was going through this kind of big period in my life, uh, or I should say significant period in my life, I was going through a breakup of a relationship I had been in for almost a decade since my early 20s, and I was changing jobs. I went from being an elementary school teacher to going and working in an office for a nonprofit organization. And amidst all of that sort of tumult that was happening in my life at the time, I decided that I needed to have a creative outlet. And so I started just taking painting classes and making things. And it was kind of my way of like, uh, ex I don't know, healing from the hard stuff that was happening in my life. And also going from being a, like a, a classroom teacher to working in an office, I had this, all this free time all of a sudden, because being a classroom teacher is, you have a kid, do you have a kid now, right? Yeah, little man's 15 little, yeah. months but and you'll, another one on the way. Right. And you'll learn once they're in grade school, it's like teachers work so hard. And so I was still working hard, but like not as hard. And so I had all this free time and I'm like, what do I want to do with it? So I started making art. I was, of course, terrible at it, as most people are when they start because I had no training. Um, but I kind of fell in love with the creative process and I started making stuff in every minute of free time I had. And the the really kind of serendipitous thing that happened was this was around the time that the internet was becoming a space for people to share the stuff they were making. Like we're so used to that now with Instagram, you know, people, Spoiled. you know, may, you know, start making art and sharing it. Like just at any moment you can share what you're making with the world and you can be a total beginner or you can be somebody who's been doing it for years. Everyone has this platform. And at the time that was sort of starting not with Instagram, but, I started on this platform called Flickr and I also um, started a blog and I started sharing pictures of the stuff I was making. I had zero aspirations to become a professional artist, but I, I started meeting people online and um, I got better and better every year that passed at, you know, the stuff I was doing. And so I started getting inquiries from people like, can I buy that from you or will you ever sell that? And, um, and again, you know, I have a lot of Instagram followers now, so you have to remember this was like 10 people following me, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I humble was a beginnings total, for sure. humble beginnings, exactly. And so you can't compare, you can't put the lens that, you know, if people follow me now, you can't put that lens on me then like, I was that person with 10 followers. And so I just started, um, you know, accepting commissions and making things to sell in shops. And I had a few tiny shows of my work at local stores in my neighborhood, that kind of thing. And I started to think, you know what, maybe if I made some smart decisions and I got better and better at this and found my voice as an artist and kind of ramped up my business skills, I could make a living at this at some point. Like maybe this is a possibility for me. So I started working at that and I kept my job in the meantime, but slowly kind of weaned myself away from my office job, went freelance in about 2007. And, you know, I had some side gigs 
to help support myself for a while. I owned a store in San Francisco for a while and I did some freelance for my old job. But eventually in 2011, I started making my full-time living as an artist. And by then I was had signed with an agent. Um, I had started to get regular work as an illustrator and um, joined Instagram, which is I think the kind of my main platform for today that I use. And um, at every year since then, my business has grown and my um, opportunities have expanded. And um, and I am now doing things I never could have imagined even five years ago, much less 10 years ago. So um, yeah, kind of figured this out and wrote a bunch of books about my what I learned also so that I could help other people do that. Seven or eight books? Eight books now. <laughs> eight books, yeah. And and one of them we'll, we'll briefly touch on, but that, that was the book tour. But what's crazy is you found your path at the age I'm at right now of 31 mm -hmm. or around that time. And that's like baffling because there's times I beat myself up saying I started the game late because I was, not to offend you, but I was kind of a fuck up. You know, I wasted a lot of, my college time being the party jock instead of yeah. like the creative jock I am now. And it took me a while to find my groove and get out of my own way. But then I still have people in my audience who 30s or 40s or some even 50 who think it's too late for them. And being that you bloomed and tapped into your creative genius a lot later, you know, what is something that you would say to someone else who feels like it's too late to even take that first step? Well, one of the things that I like to remind people is that and this is definitely something I figured out about myself, is that oftentimes we think of our age or um, the years that have passed in our life or the fact that we've done something different besides a creative career as a detriment, right? Like that we've spent all of this time doing other things. But actually, that's your strength. That's your superpower. Your age is actually your helping you, your experience in life, having another job or focusing on something else is actually going to end up helping you in your career. And I, for a long time, I had a lot of, you know, what we, we call imposter syndrome, right? Like I, um, I was like, who am I to do this? Who am I to, you know, I don't, I'm just a, you know, at the time I was, I was starting out, I was like in my early forties and you know, I, I started painting and drawing when I was 31, but I didn't actually start my business until I was 39. And so I start my business and I'm thinking like, who am I to do this? I'm just this woman who like used to be a school teacher and then worked in an education nonprofit and, you know, and it, you just doubt yourself, right? And, but what I realized is that all of that life experience that I had teaching and working in an office were the things exactly the things that helped propel my career forward faster because I understood basic things like the importance of communication and um, I, I had learned in my job like how to organize my time and I had a lot of perspective about failure that I think a lot of younger people don't have because I had failed so many times at so many things and I didn't freak out when things didn't go perfectly the first time right because I understood that's just part of life. And so I feel like we have to flip that notion of it being too late on its head. Like you actually have more wisdom, more perspective, um, you know, more creativity than you had when you were younger. It's to your advantage. And I think if we start to think of it that way, it will it will self-actualize. It's more of a mental shift to help you get out of your own way, which I still struggle with it too, like imposter syndrome. I tell... We, we believe the stories we tell ourselves mm -hmm. and for a long time like I have it right now I'm like why is a a young gentleman from Iowa that nobody even everybody thinks is Ohio or Idaho like why do I get a chance to talk to people that I really look up to like I don't belong here you know and it's like things like that I tell myself and I, I actually have to get a tattoo to remind myself like you belong here so I don't is that what your tattoo says you, you belong, belong here. here and then yeah. you got this because affirmations are huge because like yes. that, that little fourth grader who got picked on, tormented, and bullied throughout life like still lives there. So it's like I need those. Yes. Some people have tattoos. Some people are enchantments. Some people, they write it everywhere. But like for me, it's breaking that, breaking that, um, those stories that I, I used to believe and tell myself. I still tell myself. So like it's just a simple shift. 
It is. And I actually went through a few years ago, I went through this period of incredible angst and I was really deep in pain about feeling like an imposter. And I did a lot. I worked with a coach and I did a lot of like work on that because I, it was like really affecting me. And, um, I went through this year where I basically started to own my experience and the fact that I was sort of coming into this um, world later in life and with different experiences as other people. Um, And I really, like, as you said, kind of flipped the story um, that I was telling myself. And instantly when I began to, to flip the story and then began to sort of sit with it, my experience changed um completely i stopped having as much anxiety my work got better i started having more opportunities um it was like i was sending all of these kind of insecure vibes out into the universe for so many years and finally i was like stop stop doing that and i frequency huh yeah and i did and it really really made a huge difference and i i am proud to say i don't you know, every now and again, I get a little bit of imposter syndrome, depending yeah, on the situation. Like, yeah, like, when do you yeah. deal with that if you do still? Every now and again. Um, but it's not a daily, uh, it's not a daily thing for me anymore. I really feel like I've started to, like, come into my own in terms of, like, owning my experience and my place in this, you know, world. And and it really was had nothing to do with anything that happened externally. It was all about, like, how I showed up and how I showed up for myself and what I told myself. So man, that some might say that's your artistic voice, I guess. Right. In a way. Yeah. And like, I think simultaneously I started to really solidify my voice when that happened, like the confidence that you have about showing up as an artist is going to come through in your work anyway. Um, so, you know, yeah, I have my visual voice, but I also started to like, you know, people would come to me for advice all the time on business because I had started to find a lot of success. So people were looking up to me and I was so nervous about sharing it at first. Like, oh, that was just my own, you know, that would just happen for me. I'm not an authority on this. And, and then I started saying, well, maybe what if I did share everything I've learned? And what if I did um, like own my experience as being valid? And maybe what if it helped other people? So I started sharing that like on social media as well and through my visual work and um and then my audience grew even more because people were like oh me too me too me too right you you think you're so alone and then you start talking about things like imposter syndrome or growing a business or the painful parts of being a creative and all that vulnerable stuff and you realize Mm -hmm. like you're not alone everyone experiences it and that's really important to feel that sense of community yeah for sure that's pretty much been the story of this show the podcast and the blog before the podcast originally was just me therapeutically talking (laughs) through anxiety and creative depression and ruts and you know help me feel not alone and then starts attracting like-minded people to the tribe as well so if we're able to get through the first hurdle of just getting out of our own way and showing up not only for others but ourselves I know you talk about that as well the next step is in terms of pursuing your interests as well in a, in a world where everyone tries to ride the coattails of the latest trend, especially younger artists trying to figure out their groove and they see what other people are doing on Instagram as their main source of inspiration, which can be deadly, um, slippery slope. I, I would love for you to speak to how important it is to pursue your interests in your work, not only owning your experiences, but pursuing your interests and how that helps you tap into your authentic artistic voice? Yeah. So it's one of the most common questions I get from people is especially people who are new to the creative process. Maybe they have a lot of talent already and maybe they, they have a lot of drive, but they're, they're not sort of like super open creatively because maybe they think, well, I should be making art that looks like this, or if I'm going to make it as an artist, I need to follow these trends. Right. Or I'm going to, you know, I need to do this or or I feel stumped because the things that I feel like I should be drawing and painting or hand lettering are not the things that I really want to, you know, I'm I'm not really sure what to paint or draw. Like, I just don't know where to start. And my advice to people in this, I talk about this a lot in my book, um, which is called uh, Find Your 
artistic voice, um, one of the places to start that I recommend is literally diving into what you are fascinated by and interested in in the world in general. Um, the the basis for everybody's um, creative journey, for everybody's artwork, no matter what your artwork looks like, it always starts with what's interesting to you. And sometimes that's super simple stuff like beautiful things you see out in the world that you want to draw. Or um, sometimes it's more complex things like things you dreamt about the night before or things that are part of your imagination. Um, it can be anything from food to books you've read to um, things that you're sort of obsessing over um, on the internet, you know, the stuff that you find yourself Googling. Um, it's maybe something in history or it's, um, you know, uh, you know, some weird rabbit hole that you're going down. And that's the stuff that you make art about is the stuff that's interesting to you because that's the stuff that's going to keep that, that's both going to keep you more engaged, right? Because if you're making art around or your creative process is driven by the stuff or inspired by the stuff that's fascinating to you and interesting to you, you're going to stay more engaged. And also you're going to end up making work that's different than anybody else's because your interests, you might have overlap in terms of what's interesting to you. But your interests are unique to you, and that's going to help you make work um, and develop subject matter for your work that is that is unique to you. And that is when you're sort of trying to figure out who you are as an artist or make work that stands out, focusing on the stuff that's interesting to you is super important. Now, that's not to say that what you're interested in isn't also potentially currently trendy, right? Yes. Um, the, a lot of the stuff I'm interested in is, ends up being stuff that other people are also making work about. And that's normal because in the world, there's like a zeitgeist of ideas, right? Like um, certain things become trendy or popular or um, interesting in terms of like, thinking or visual stuff that's out in the world um, that's completely normal but really focusing so that you know don't trip if what you the work you're making also falls in the trend category actually you're lucky if that's true because you know trends matter um, but really focusing on what you find yourself thinking about and using that as the fodder for whatever it is you make work about I think is like one of the very important steps in like finding your finding your creative voice another thing that's been like crucial for me is connecting with all the weird shit i loved as a kid yes that seems to like really repeat in patterns with the things i love today like my i was obsessed growing up with outer space and aliens yes and pizza like i drew pizza every day because like macaulay culkin a lovely cheese pizza just for me and home alone yeah. or uh, ninja turtles was my jam and all those patterns i'm like wow that's like shows up and the bullying makes the word of this positive side of me and yes. my work come from it came from me as a kid getting bullied you know so That's it's right. like connecting those dots and it's all your yeah. own experience and you're yes, taking yes, that right and that. owning it it's like your story um i don't know if you know andy miller but he also like big fan of andy ton of his work is inspired by the stuff he was obsessed with as a kid and um that's not the stuff to reject. That's that's the stuff to dive into, especially if it's still fascinating to you. Yeah, I agree 100%. So, like, what are the, some of the things then over the years, not only that you, you focus your work around belief systems, values, and what are some things that interest you now that show up in your work or things that you're experimenting with now to bring into your work? You know, I um, I have... What's interesting is in the last few years, I have, I did this, I started this project in 2000, oh gosh, it's been a while now, but in 2012, I did a project called 365 Days of Hand Lettering because I had become an illustrator who was starting to get her work into the world, but I had terrible lettering skills. And at the time there was like no Skillshare, there was no place to like sign up for a class to You're learn lettering. You were on that first true wave of I like was. the resurgence of lettering. So I was just like lettering. DIY, right? Like I was just kind of 
stumbling through and figuring it out myself. And so I did this whole year where I like hand lettered something every day. And so when you hand letter things, you have to have words or phrases that you hand letter because um, it needs to sort of make sense to your audience, especially if you're going to be sharing it. And so I just ended up over the course of that year hand lettering quotations and phrases and things that were uh, like inspiring or interesting to me. And um, my hand lettering back then looked very different than it does now because I've been working on it for seven years. And when you, or eight years, when you, when you work on something for eight years, it, it evolves and changes and gets more refined and gets better and better. And so, um, but the roots were there. And so as I started to use words in my work more, because I became proficient at hand lettering, I started to think like, maybe this is a great marriage of talking about a what I've learned as an artist about the creative process to share with my audience B other things that feel important to me like that are happening in the world that I want to support like inclusion and tolerance and love and all of those things that feel so fraught right now especially in the U.S. and yeah. Great Britain um and then um and then also yeah other personal values and so I have come to this place in the last couple of years where I've just been, not all my work has lettering in it, but a lot of it does. And part of that is because there's this, like I found this part of my voice is this mess, this marriage between um, messages and illustration and, um, and kind of like also connecting with people around stuff that, is interesting to them or that they're struggling with um, and using my social media as a place for people to talk about, you know, different topics uh, around being a creative or whatever. And so that's been something that's been really amazing that has happened kind of organically through my hand lettering. And then um, also, you know, my voice as a person who, you know, has a lot to say. <laughs> I think I think something really, really powerful in that is people lose sight of the long game mm -hmm. and people lose sight of the value and the power of consistency. And you play in the long game of a 365, like multiple people I know who've done a 365 project early on are the people that are making the biggest waves in the community right now. Like Andy Miller, you, Bob Ewing and the consistency part, but you pursuing your interest, your experience within your work, you've built a community around your work, around your values. And I think yeah. people lose sight of that opportunity they have. Well, and it's true. It's like you people, we all want, we all, we all want stuff to happen now, right? It's mm. so hard to think, you know what? I want to be a well-known hand lettering artist. I want to be a well-known illustrator. I want to, I want to be eventually have success as this, or, you know, as a graphic designer or whatever, but we don't want to wait for it. We want it to happen now. But unfortunately, in order to get really, really proficient at your, your whatever it is you aspire to do, it just takes time. And that doesn't mean that you can't have success along the way and that you can't make money. It just means that it takes forever. In fact, so I've been on this book tour and um, the first question I started to ask about midway through the tour. So I don't know if I asked this at Creative Works or not, because um, I can't remember if I had gotten there yet. But one of the questions I started to ask was, and I and I talked to almost exclusively audiences of, of artists and designers. How many of you consider yourself an artist or designer? Almost everyone in the room raises their hand. How many of you um, feel like you found your voice already. Yeah, you asked this. My uh, hand went say, halfway up. <laughs> yeah, so some people, and you'd be surprised, in these rooms full, I had some rooms where only a third of the people raised their hands, and some even fewer. Typically, it's about half. So then I'll ask, of those people who just didn't raise, who, who didn't raise their hand, in other words, those people who... Um, who don't feel like they've found their voice yet, how many of you have been working in the industry for more than five years? And so many hands shoot up. So this is just a reminder that even people who've been working as a designer, whether you're a freelancer in-house or an illustrator or whatever, 
for a significant amount of time, and five years is significant, even those folks don't feel like they've arrived yet at this place where they're kind of in that creative flow and they've figured out who they are. It takes a very long time um, to really feel, to, to get there and also to feel confident in it. And, um, and that's just because practice and showing up over and over and over. I mean, I did that 365 day project, but then I also continued to work on my lettering in a more casual way for seven or eight years after that to get to where I am now. So it's like you have to show up for the long game. And, you know, we all need the sort of like short term successes to bolster us, to help us feel motivated to keep going, because it's sure. really easy to feel like you want to throw in the towel. But um, but it's really uh, it is something that requires a lot of discipline and focus because it doesn't for most people happen overnight. Everyone, at least a lot of people I know, get frustrated and throw in the towel quick because it's a microwave society. Viral right. night stars, even though it wasn't viral, looking for cheat codes and shortcuts like it's a video game. It's true. And I think that's especially true for the younger generation, right? Like, um, you're a, are you a, you're a millennial, a millennial, right? Yep. Okay. But like, I think millennials less so, but Gen Z, they're like so used to getting immediate, you know, they have had access to the, they don't know what a world is without immediate answers to everything without having to wait to figure, you know what I mean? Like we have immediate access to information and answers and all those things and classes and, you know, teaching you this and learning this. And, um, I, I worry that for a lot of younger people, they're, they're, they're potentially going to give up because they don't understand what it feels like to sort of suffer through, you know, um, as some of us who are older understand. Well, and something else I know you talk about in the book, your artistic voice, it's never a final destination. And that was right. really, really encouraging because I look at, you know, some other people that I really look up to, like you and Andy J. Miller and all other people. It's like, man, I feel like they found it. But yet when you say that it's constantly evolving, I was like, okay, well, wow, yeah. I'll, we'll talk about the cycle here in a second as well because that really, really, really uh, spoke to me. But I'm like, you reaffirmed like, okay, I'm in a cycle and I'm so close to like finding that true artistic voice and I can't wait to see what it evolves into next once I continue to embrace things. So that was a big time thing for me, knowing that your voice is still evolving. Yay. Oh, yeah. Look at where you are right now. You said 52? Yeah. Yeah, I'm about to turn 52 in another month. And um and I've been, you know, I have been doing this for 20 years. I've been I've, I've been making art professionally for about um almost 13 and I have been drawing and painting for t almost 20 years now or about 20 years. And I like I'm taking a sabbatical this coming year because I um I'm going to take a break from client work for a while because I want to part of what I want to figure out is like, what's next for me? Like, what can I evolve into? What's like, I think, I think we think like, oh, we need to find this voice and stay with it forever. But that would be so boring. Um, to me, I feel like it's always important to like figure out either how to refine what you're doing, how to expand what you're doing, how to keep it interesting. And I have been so busy, you know, working for clients and writing and illustrating books that I haven't really had to much time to explore like my inner world or what we were talking about earlier, which is my own personal interest as much as I'd like to. So I'm really excited to see like, what is the next phase of my own personal voice? You know, I don't know. I think we're all excited. I want to see what, oh, thank what, you. what else can you do? Like what, what <laughs> else is next for you? I know. Um, I know. Who knows? Speaking of the cycle again, going back to the book, this was like one of the biggest things that impacted me was, um, um, and finding your artistic voice is trusting the cycle, this repetitive cycle. It's not a linear path. It's more of, I believe you called it a bumpy cycle, a repetitive yeah. cycle of the spark, the ongoing desire to create, risk-taking, experimentation, questioning, and creative flow. Um, if, if you could, just give a quick summary of each one because I really yeah. want to dive into the questioning one because that's where I think so many people in the audience live. Right. So the spark is basically what happens at that moment when you're like, I need to make things. You know, you talked about being an art jock and like, I'm also an athlete. So like, I, I can yeah, relate to that a lot. Yeah, of jock life. You get I it. I know. In fact, I'm, we're talking. Um, you're in a track right suit. I am because I just came from the gym. Not that I don't wear my track jacket like 
when I'm not coming from the you gym. You look creatively <laughs> fit right now. I'm going to the gym <laughs> right when we get done. Thank you. <laughs> I know. I, I couldn't survive creatively without my workouts. But anyway, I, I, um, the spark is like that moment when you realize you're a creative nerd or a creative jock or like that you have, you are a person who has to make things. And for some people that happens when they're like three, right? You're, you know, you're just that kid who like is super creative and knows they have to, um, have to make things. And like, you almost identify differently than other, other people, even if you have similar interests, um, including sports, but you just know, like making stuff is in your blood. And for some people, and that happens often just through experience, but sometimes it's like, um, you get woken up to art just by seeing it for the first time, um, or experience making it for the first time. And for some people that happens when they're three, as I mentioned, and for some people it doesn't happen to their 65, right? When that happens for you isn't important, but it's that moment when you're like, yeah. And then there's this sort of, I think, I, I don't know what I call it in the book because I don't have the book in front of me, but um, I think it's like the on, ongoing desire to create, right? Like there's this, um, having the spark is one thing, but then there's the desire to show up and make stuff. And a lot of people are creative and they think constantly about what they want to make or I'm going to do, I mean, how many people do we know that say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, but they never do it, right? Don't back it because up with they're action. totally, that's right. They're probably overcome with fear, which, you know, many of us have been there as well. Um, but real like creative people actually can't help themselves. They have to, they don't just buy the supplies, they actually use them. And then, you know, there's this also kind of period of experimentation and failure that we all go through, right? That is like, okay, so when you do show up to make art or design stuff, um, it can be really vulnerable and um, incredibly, um, I don't know, like painful even because, um, our idea of what we want to make is so far beyond what we're currently capable of doing. Like we always aspire to be doing better work and making different work than, you know, than we're making now, even as a artist who has a, a lot of skills, I still aspire to do better. Would right? you call it the beginner gap? Yeah, I call it the beginner gap. Um, actually, you know, I didn't invent that term, but like, that's what we, I refer to it in the book is this, you know, this place where we want, we, you know, we want to get to that place where what we envision ourselves making, because that always looks, our taste is always more developed than, right, than our, than our current skill level. And so that requires just diving into what I call the shark tank, right? Like that there's just like uh, this period where you, where you have to just experiment and fail and learn and go back and start all over again, because there's no way you can get to the final vision of what you want your work to look like for me it's taken years without just continually showing up and practicing and experimenting and all of that um and then eventually I'm, i think i'm skipping some phases here um you know you get into the flow um for sure like that's an indication you're finding your voice is when you're starting to make things um consistently and your the look and feel of your work feels more comfortable to you and like you're really starting to feel a sense of like even control over your work and where it's headed and you can sit down and draw things without too much struggle that's always a sign that you're getting closer but there's this big thing which happens which is questioning and i know you this is a so I think a lot of people, they get to the, the flow state or the, they start to find their voice. They, they muck through all that struggle and they're like, okay, I'm here. I've arrived. And then what happens is we start after a period of time of being like, I'm bored or does my work even matter? Or am I, am what I'm doing, is what I'm doing any good anyway? You know, the stuff I thought was great six months ago doesn't feel so great anymore. And then that freaks us out because we're like, wait a second, <laughs> I haven't arrived. And I remember when I went through this for the first time, I had no idea that this was part of the cycle, that this was part of the process, that it was completely normal. And I even considered like throwing in the towel because I was seriously having this existential yes. crisis. Yes. And um, 
I'm bored. I don't think what I what I'm making looks looks good. I, I maybe I you know and and to further trip us up, we've got social media. So then we've got like we're putting stuff out into the world, and if it doesn't get a certain amount of likes or whatever, we question whether it's any good. And we've got all these like external feedback loops that are happening, and so there's there's always these periods of questioning, which I think it's imperative that we stay inside of and grapple with not as a excuse to be sort of not do anything or to be paralyzed, but more to like dive into and work through to get to the other side of them. And so I recommend that when people are in periods of questioning and doubt that they, you know, take a break or figure out, like write about what you're feeling um, and always think about like, is this questioning because I really am bored or feel like I, I want to change up my work in some way. And then if that's true, how can I do that? Or B, is it because I'm getting feedback from the outside, um, either direct feedback from someone that my work isn't any good or that like I'm um, not seeing the results I want on social media. So I'm starting to doubt myself because that happens a lot for folks. Um, and really kind of analyzing where is this coming from and how can I show up, continue to show up despite the questioning and move through it and then move to the next phase of my creative process. Because the, the, you know, the good news is you can work through questioning periods. The bad news is the questioning period will happen again and then it'll happen again. And that's just, if we accept it as a normal part of the creative process and we begin to see it as something that's actually really healthy for us um, to question our work and like think about like, what's next for us. I'm going through a questioning period this year, which is why I'm taking a sabbatical. Cause I, I'm kind of like bored with a lot of stuff I'm making and I want to, and so instead of saying, all right, I'm done, I'm going to say, okay, then what else is there? If this isn't exactly what I want to be doing anymore, what else is there? Um, and dedicating yourself to that process. So like why it tripped me up when I was, when I was reading it, it was that part in particular, like the cycle, I'm like, oh, hell yeah. I, I understand all this. I feel yeah. like I've been here. I've been here. But the questioning one, I was like, damn, that one made me reflect on over the last five and a half years of like really, really taking my work seriously for the first time in my life and pursuing this side hustle. Looking back on all those moments of questioning, I was like, wow, that overlapped when I was creatively depressed, when I was that one time I was in a funk, that one time that, you know, I just doubted myself and almost threw in the towel and I, like I overlapped it. And I'm like, holy crap, that was the cycle leading up to this part. And I stuck through it to found my groove within uh, the creative flow part. And then the whole cycle repeated again. I'm like, wow, it made me like replay all those years and see how the cycle has worked within my life. And it just tripped me out. Well, it's well, the cool thing is that I realized when I was writing the book that every period of questioning I'd been through was followed by a creative explosion. Yes. Because I stayed in the questioning and I didn't walk away from it. And I just used the questioning to move me to something new. Because when you have anxiety about something, it means that it's something you need. It's just information. It's just like if we have doubt or depression or like creatively, it's just an indication that you need to look at what you're doing. You need to look at your process. You need to look at what you're making. Like, why am I feeling this way? And really work through that. And what often happens is if you can work through that, you get an even better place afterwards. The gold was always on the other side. That's right. When I, Pushing through, I, maybe working through, because pushing through, yeah, you need the break, helping yeah. me talk about yeah, it, exactly. making, a, making an episode, just venting how I felt. Even if it was just for me, I know it was going to impact someone else, but like, working through that questioning phase has always led me to another breakthrough in my creative career. Mm -hmm. And that's what I really want to drive home with other people is the fact that you say it's normal gives all of us so much permission to realize that the sunny days are on the other side of this shit storm that we're going through at the moment. That's right. And that every single person goes through it. Like it, all of your art heroes, all of your design heroes, like all of your lettering heroes, like, all of your entrepreneurial heroes, like they all go through periods where they are questioning or when they are doubtful, like everyone experiences it. No one is immune to it. And um, 
it's just part of it's part of the cycle and um, sometimes the periods of questioning are quick and not so brutal and sometimes they lay you up for like six months yeah. and um, the important thing is not to give up love it love it um being that this show is perspective podcast it's perspective for a reason and it's also fuel for your mind and creative grind. So a question I've been liking to ask people as like I've really dug deep on what are my sources. So I'd like to ask you, what are your internal or external forces that fuel your daily grind, AKA your why, what drives you to show up for yourself and others? Yeah, people? you know, it's so interesting that you bring this up because I, I made an Instagram post about this very question, um, uh, gosh, uh, like last week or the week before, people ask me all the time, like, well, specifically, it was a lot of times people are framing it as like, what, um, how do you show up on social media? Or how do you continue to produce work and share it with the world? Because that feels really exhausting to people. And, um, and so I thought about it, and I made this Venn diagram. And so I'm actually going to look at it right now while we're talking. So, to, I'm so gonna I get look this. at it too. Uh, um, so I posted it on um, November 25th, but so, cause I think part of, so part of the struggle for a lot of people is, you know, as you mentioned, like what inspires you to, to make the work, but then it's also like what inspires you and motivates you to show up in the world with your work, right? Cause it's one thing to make work and keep it to yourself. It's another work to make work, work and put it out into the world. And um, that is sometimes for some people, the harder part, right? So it's for me, it's the whole package because my career wouldn't exist if I wasn't sharing my work with the world. And that takes a certain amount of vulnerability. Um, so uh, so one of the circles in my Venn diagram says, chase what inspired me in arts. So basically that's like me, that's what we were talking about earlier. Like what's interesting to me? What's, what's making me feel um, motivated to like, show up and you know you know how you wake up sometimes at two in the morning to go to the bathroom or whatever or to like you wake up from a dream and then you start thinking and you get this great idea and you can't wait to write it down because um you know you're like oh, i hope i don't forget this in the morning right or you're in the shower or whatever that's always when the best ideas come correct and um you know it's like that to me is like the crux of what I do is that stuff that speaks to me that I want to make art about or make illustrations about or like things I see that I use as inspiration. So that's one thing, like what's interesting to me. Um, and then there's this way that I want to honor and reflect my values and interests. And so we were talking about this earlier, like, um, you know, part of my value system is like being a good person in the world and showing up for love and inclusion and tolerance and um, and also making people who are helping people who are starting out on this creative path understand that it's hard and that we have to um, kind of slog through sometimes, but that they're not alone. And so a lot of what I how I show up and share is through this sense that um, that I'm being helpful to people, right? That my experience and sharing service. that is actually, yeah, it's service that I am doing a service to people by showing up as myself. And that might, that I'm like taking up space, but that that actually is helpful to people. And, um, and so that's part of what motivates me, like this idea of service. And then, and that's also why I write a lot of the books that I write. And then also I do pay attention to what my audience enjoys, not as the sole driver as, of what I make and, 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 you know, or, you know, how I show up, but somebody commented on this post, um, or maybe it wasn't on this post, but it was somebody wrote me a message about like, shouldn't, why should we pay attention to what other people enjoy? And I'm like, well, so for the purpose of social media, I don't think it should be the primary thing. But if you want to grow an audience for your work, um, it is important to sort of pay attention to like, what things am I posting that people are responding to? What's getting engagement? And usually for me, it's the stuff where I'm talking about like being a real human being, right? Like the stuff we deal with. People love that stuff because people want to feel more human. And if you're human and you're sharing your humanity, it gives other people permission to do the same. And that's so that's what I mean. I, I pay attention to what is my audience responding to? And it's not that every single post I make is something that 
I think is going to get a lot of engagement. Sometimes I post stuff that I, I don't think is going to get very much at all because it's important for me to share for other reasons. Yeah. But, um, but I do think paying attention to that is a way to, to connect with people who have similar interests. And um, that's also motivating to me. That inspires me to show up as this, you know, this interplay between me and my community. And I like, I call it my audience, but really in a, in a lot of ways, it's, you know, it's my community. It's the people that consume my work and respond to my work and purchase my work and, um, and also engage with my work and with me. And I feel very motivated by that engagement, by that community. I think being a, especially a freelance creative is extremely, isolating sometimes you spend a lot of time by yourself I'm gonna and figure that out soon <laughs> yeah and the only community you really feel like you have is on the internet and so making that community a positive space for yourself um and for others is for me just um such an integral part of what I do yeah I think that's awesome and for someone who's not on Lisa's level or someone who's hasn't been doing it for five and a half years like I have um I think what she said of the first two parts of pursuing your interests and something that aligns with your values and belief systems, really, those are your one-two punch before you start worrying about what other people oh, yeah. are 100%. thinking if you those don't are... have a community. I don't want people That's to get it right. twisted like, okay, well, maybe I can skip these first two and just focus on this little part of the Venn diagram. So, right. And I also think part of what I say in the, the, um, just the, the words underneath that Venn diagram is that um, – you have to, and I think this is why you asked the question in the first place, each one of us has to figure out, and I encourage people, as I'm sure you would too, to sit down and think about what, why do I show up? Yeah. What is, what is, what, what is motivating to me? What makes me feel like getting out of bed and doing this for a living every day? And if you can make a list of those things and then use those as your Make your own Venn diagram, and it might look just like mine. It might look completely different. Maybe you have no interest in being of service, which is completely fine, but there's some other thing that motivates you um, to show up either on social media or in other ways in your life through your work. Like, Figure out what those things are and be really explicit about them with yourself and, um, and use them instead of using the stuff that you dread, right? Because there's always stuff that we dread, um, and focusing on what's working instead of what's not working is yeah. often a good way to start. Let's uh, let's make an action item real quick for the listeners. I want, I, I, th I think it was brilliant how you said it, write down the reasons why you show up. What was the reason you show up? Create a list, make a Venn diagram, whatever it is, and share that. Make sure you like tag me and her in your notes. Cause I would love to like reshare that. To yes. add a, sprinkle a little fire on that fuel for people. So <laughs> I think that's like a, an incredible action step. So yeah. um, let's let's pivot so I can respect your time and let's go into a uh, rapid fire question. And me being a, a pizza junkie as it is too, um, <laughs> <laughs> like this is a question I love asking people right off the gate. If you were on death row, what would your last slice of pizza be? Pepperoni. I like it. Anywhere specific? I, what? Anywhere, Anywhere specific? Anywhere specific. No, I just, uh, I, there, there's so many great pizza places in Portland. I can't even choose one, but I, um, I freaking love pepperoni. I don't, I'm not even a big meat eater. I don't, I just love the taste of pepperoni pizza. And, um, it's like, I don't eat it very often, but when I do, it's, it's pretty incredible. So yeah. <laughs> Pepperoni's my jam. Okay. <laughs> I think I already know this one, but people might not. So, so, uh, strip yeah. sans serif. Or serif? Oh, um, sans serif. Just go look at your account. It's pretty much <laughs> everywhere. Um, if you could have lunch with one person, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Um, that's a hard question, but, uh, oh, gosh. I, I didn't send it to you ahead of time either. <laughs> This exact okay, reason. Okay. I want to put I, you on the You spot. know what? Coming to front of mine is Michelle Obama. Okay. Why is that? Um, I think she's pretty amazing. And I I actually, I don't know. I, I, I read her book last year, Becoming. And um, the crap she went through that 
most people who haven't read her book don't know about was pretty startling to me. And um, like what she endured as first lady. Um, and I think obviously being the first black first lady um, is something that she had to sort of keep under wraps. And then she wrote about it in the book. And I think that a lot of her experience was really painful. And I would love to just connect with her about what that was like. And um, I just think she's a pretty incredible, classy woman. And I would love to be in her presence. I could think of about 10 more people, but um, but she's definitely one of them. Cool. Um, if you were stranded on an island, what would the three pieces of art supplies you would have to have with you? <laughs> um, my, my iPad, my Apple Pencil, and a charger. <laughs> <laughs> okay cool that's, that that's works. A little like bit a there, solar but... charger that's that's fine people have said similar stuff in the past I draw it's... the most on my ipad and um, i feel like as much as i love analog supplies um that's my go-to medium so it's, it's <laughs> become mine too i was pretty romantic about the analog and then i'm like all these people with ipads jumping on trends and then i got one i'm like holy shit this changed I my know. life <laughs> yeah. See, i was exactly the same yeah uh last one before uh I asked where people can follow you online, but um, since Oregon is a hot spot for UFO sightings, do you believe in UFOs at all? No. <laughs> That's all uh, right. I I don't know. Like, I'm kind of fascinated by things like that, like reading about weird stuff. Um, do you, do but, you believe we're alone in the universe? No. Just our human race? No, on and so therefore me, but I don't necessarily think that I'm not meaning like necessary little green men jumping out of. Yeah, no, exactly. And that those intelligences, the 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 intelligent beings on other in out in the universe, um, aren't necessarily building UFOs either. But I do believe there's other life in the universe for sure. How could we be um, the only ones? Thank you. I think it's so ignorant to think us on this little speck of dust floating <laughs> in this vast infinite universe. That we're the only ones here on billions of other planets out there? Okay, cool. Agreed. But aliens are real, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, last thing, where can people go to file, uh, follow you and support you online? Yeah, so um, the place I show up sort of pretty regularly is, um, is Instagram. And my handle is just my name, at Lisa Congdon. And um, I also have a website, lisacongdon.com, where... Um, you can buy things from me and there's like links to all of my online classes. And, um, I own a storefront in Portland. So, which is open on, um, Wednesdays and Fridays from one to five for the most part, I have some exceptions. Like sometimes I have winter hours, but, um, uh, and people I'm often there when I'm not traveling. So people can come actually say hi to me in person, which I love. Awesome. And the information on that is on my website as well. Cool. I'll make sure to plug everything up in the show notes as well. Lisa, thank you again so much for working with me, my crazy schedule, moving my house, my kid being home with me, all this stuff. Like it means the world to me. And I know you dropped a lot of gold in this one that people are going to be able to apply to their side hustles and freelance game ASAP starting this new year off. So thank you. Thank you for having me, Scotty. No problem. <laughs> we'll be in touch. Thank you. Yes. Bye. Thanks again for listening. It'd be awesome if you took the time to subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and let the comment below so we can connect. Again, if you want to catch a shout out as a future listener of the week, make sure you subscribe to the show on iTunes and give it a rating and review.